The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. The Lord's great concern is not for this little handful of evangelists or others who are uh, fooling the people. No, His great concern is for this great host, this many, this great number in His house who are going to be exposed only at the judgment day. They're going to stand before the Lord expecting Him to embrace them. They expect to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Instead, the Lord will give them the face of wrath and He'll say, depart from me. I have never known you. I don't know who you are. These many are the multitudes are going to stand aghast. They're going to be absolutely appalled. They're going to be in absolute shock because they could not conceive that they could be among this number. Folks, the Bible says there are going to be many that come. I don't think there are enough adjectives to describe that moment when they stand before the Lord expecting an embrace, expecting your well done, thou good and faithful servant. And the Lord turns aside. He said, you are a worker of iniquity. I don't know you. What do you mean? He doesn't know me. I have prophesied in his name, in the name of Jesus. I have laid hands on the sick and I have seen them healed. I've seen many healed in the name of Jesus. I have seen people demon possessed, Lord. And you know, you were there, surely you saw it. Demons came out. They fled at the name of Jesus. I used your name. It was in the name of Jesus that I ministered, Lord. I did many works, Lord. I gave my time to the church. I was busy in Sunday school. I did all these things. I would give the coat off my back, the clothes off my back. I would have given everything. I would let my body be burned at the stake if necessary. And they can't believe it because the Lord says, No, you are a worker of iniquity. None of what you did counts. I don't acknowledge any of it. Depart from me. I've never known you, you work of iniquity. Let me tell you how serious this is. First of all, this is Jesus talking. This is red letter. That's Christ speaking. This is so serious that I feel it so strong in my heart that I've had to judge myself in the light of this and say, I can't overlook this. Lord, I want you to look into my heart. Could, could it be that after all these years of preaching, after all of my giving of my time and my money and all this effort, could I possibly be in this number in any way or shape or form? You say, oh, surely you have greater security in Christ than that. I can't get away. I can't overlook. I can't overpass what he says. You did it all in my name. You thought you were right. He says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. It's an alarming, alarming text, alarming passage. Who are these workers of iniquity? What are the distinguishing marks of those who Jesus is going to call strangers to him? So you're a stranger to me. I don't know you. Now, beloved, I have spent all these years in my preaching trying to accomplish two things. That's to edify the righteous and to rebuke the wicked. And the Bible says, woe to the man who blesses the wicked and condemns the righteous. I've tried to keep in that balance and keep in that line. And I have preached a lot in this church along some of these subjects. But I, if you have never heard anything I've ever preached from this pulpit, you that have been here years, or you've been here a long time, you hear me like you've never heard me before. It's possible that you're sitting here and you worship tonight and you praise the Lord and you are convinced you're going to heaven and you may not even be saved. You say, Brother well, Wilson, I can't accept that. I may lose some of you, but I'm going to give it to you from the Word. This is not something, this is not some the theology of my own. I'm going to give you the Scripture. I have the fear of God upon me. And I want you to listen to these distinguishing marks of a work of iniquity. First of all, a work of iniquity is one who is not committed wholeheartedly to do the will of God. The scripture says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, the will of God is not hard to know. The will of God is simply what is revealed here, what Jesus said to do, his commandments. His commandments are his will, his written word. For example, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now, that's the will of God that you love one another, you love your brother, you love your sister, you love your neighbor, you love your enemy. That is the will of God. And the Bible said, if you are not fully committed to the will of God, you are a work of iniquity. 
You can't enter the kingdom of God. Call yourself saved. Tell me that you've laid hands on a comatose person and that person jumped up out of bed. Tell me you've laid hands on people that are in wheelchairs and they jumped out of bed. Tell me you preached to thousands. You're not saved if you're not committed to the perfect will of God in loving your brother and your sister. You can't enter the kingdom, the Bible says. You can't enter. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there's no occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walks in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goes, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. You're not saved. You have no eternal life because you have a grudge. You have murder in your heart. You have hatred against a brother or sister. You're not saved. If a man says, I love God and hated his brother, he's a liar. First John 4.20. You can be in the pulpit. You can be a world famous evangelist. You can be a caretaker. You can be a, 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 a nurse. You can be a doorman. It doesn't matter who you are. If you sit here tonight, and there is something in your heart against the brother, against the sister, against someone on your job, against your neighbor. And the Bible says, who is your neighbor? It's anybody who's hurting left beside the wayside. And yet there is something in your heart against somebody. There is murder in your heart, the Bible says. If you harbor a grudge, unkind thoughts toward a fellow believer or a neighbor, you become blind. The Bible said you walk in darkness, you're a murderer, you're a liar. That's exactly what he says. Because every song you sing, every praise you make is a lie. Because out of your heart, you never dealt with it when you first came to Jesus. It was there and you did not deal with it. And it's still there and it's destroying you. It's the perfect will of God that you love your brother and your sister. That means that you suffer hurt. You take abuse. You don't envy. You're kind to those who misuse you. You take the lowly place and let you let others take the higher place. You're to be kind. You're not to seek your own. You're not to be easily provoked. You will think no evil of others. You will bear all things that are put on you by others, the scripture says. You show me a Christian who's mean-spirited and quick-tempered, pouting. Are you sitting here pouting tonight because somebody hurt you? Do you walk around with a pout? Do you tell somebody else, I've been abused? I shouldn't be talked to like this. I shouldn't be... Uh, they shouldn't act like this toward me. And you develop this hatred in your heart. You develop this feeling of unkindness. I'll show you one if you walk around like I'll show you one who's not really saved. Second distinguishing mark of a work of iniquity. A work of iniquity is one whose tongue has not been sanctified. I want you to go to James 3, please. Now, folks, this is serious business. James, the third chapter, beginning of verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. Folks, that's the body of Christ, that's the church. And setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things of the sea is tamed, and have been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Now, folks, I want you to hear it, hear it in your spirit. The tongue, he says, is a world of iniquity, unruly, evil, set on fire of hell. And he said, there are Christians. And he's writing to my brethren. He's writing to Krishna. He says, my brethren, my brethren. I speak to brethren tonight. I speak to brethren, including men and women. You call yourself, we call ourselves the children of God. We are brethren. And he said, my brethren, these things ought not to be. That people can have the blessing of God, the praises and the worship come out of their tongue. And then turn right around the next day or even the same evening. And out of their mouth comes gossip, slander. He says, how can you conceivably understand? How can you not be a worker of iniquity? You are absolute worker of iniquity, the Bible says. You are working iniquity. You're poisoning the body of Jesus Christ. According to God's word, many, many who call themselves Christians, if their tongue is not tamed, if it's still from the time they said, I give my heart to Jesus, we've got this thing so cockeyed. We say, you know, the Bible does say, 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But folks, the Bible answers the Bible. You have to go to all the building blocks. That's one building block. Do you believe to the point that you'll surrender everything that's unlike Jesus? Are you going to sanctify a tongue that was before you were saved, a world of iniquity, speaking as it pleased, out of control, unruly, the Bible says. Absolutely unruly tongue. Then you say, oh, I gave my heart to Jesus. Oh, you did, did you? What did you do about the tongue? Has it been sanctified? Has your tongue been dipped in the blood? Folks, I've preached a lot about gossip in this church. I've, I've looked out over some of my messages I've preached from the first time I came here in 1988. I pulled out some of my old sermons and I looked over it and folks, I was preaching the same thing I'm preaching right now. I warned and I warned I must in the past eight years had at least 50 messages against gossip and slander and using the tongue because I know, I know what God thinks of this. I know how dangerous it is. And one of these days, I don't care how many good works, I don't care what you've done in this church or any church, I don't care how holy you claim to be, all the great works, if you're on the telephone, if you're with your brother and sister and you're talking about your brother or sister against brother Dave Wilkerson, against this man, or any elders, or anybody in any church, you are a worker of iniquity and you are not saved. I'm not mad at you, but I'm going to stand before a throne. i got to look Jesus in the face. I didn't come here to be paid. I'm not a hireling. I have to go into God's Word, and when the Word smacks me in the face and says, David, this is for you, and it's for your congregation, I preach it. Go to verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. In other words, don't go praising the Lord, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, it's devilish. Folks, how can you be saved? How can you be Anything but a work of iniquity if it's devilish and sensuous. Or where envy and strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. And folks, let me tell you how you can distinguish between a work of iniquity and a work of righteousness. A worker of righteousness operates on the principle of practicing and promoting peace. Read the next verse. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is what? Sown in peace of them that make peace. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for peacemakers. Thank God for those. You don't put people down and come to you with a strand of a bitten morsel of gossip or slander about somebody. You don't just say, get away from me. You just say, brother, I'm for peace. I'm not for any of this. I'm a peacemaker. Don't disturb my peace. I wish every one of you get on the telephone and promote peace. Just talk peace. You want to come to the pastor? Put your arm around and say, peace, brother. Peace. Gentleness. Kindness. Oh, we've got a lot of those gentle, kind people in this church. Church full of kind, gentle people. I, more and more, every time I, I, I greet people and I see that gentleness and kindness, the Lord is producing something in this church. But he's dealing with something because there's some here tonight in serious trouble. Serious trouble. And I tell you, this mess is going to save you from hell. It's going to save you. That's what love is all about. Oh, it's nice to just get up and pat people on the back, tell them it's all right, and go out and be pat on the back, and I'd be a nice joke. I'd be nice accepted. Everybody loved me. I'd rather you get mad at me and get out of the, the mess, and then later come back and tell me, hey, you were right. Hallelujah. You still with me? If you have envy and strife in your hearts, don't glory and don't lie against the truth. Let's go to the, the last distinguishing mark of a work of iniquity. A work of iniquity is one who is bound with bitterness, one who is trapped in a prison of unforgiveness. Listen to Matthew 6, 14, 15. If you have the King James, would you read it aloud with me? For if we forgive men their trespasses, your Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Does that mean that if you have an unforgiving, bitter spirit, and you're not forgiving somebody, does that mean your sins are still piled up against you? That's what it says. Father won't forgive you. Jesus said that. I didn't say it. Not even the Apostle Paul said it. I would believe it if he said it. But Jesus said it. He said, if you forgive men, I'll forgive you. Your Father will forgive you. If you will not forgive your brother, if you will not forgive those who come to you repenting, if you will not forgive them, your, your Heavenly Father will not forgive 
You, are you on your way to heaven? Are you a worker of iniquity? It's God's perfectly revealed will. Remember, he that does the will of God only will inherit eternal life. And what is the will of God? That you have no bitterness in your heart, no envy, no strife, that you have a forgiving spirit. Folks, I don't understand. I honestly don't understand how anybody can be a part of a body of believers and come together and worship like we did tonight and you get up and walk out the door and you have this in your heart you've got this hurt you've got this grief because somebody has done you wrong said something that hurt you something that grieved you there are some of you here that have been divorced someone sent a letter to my wife this week and i, I it was laying on the bed and I, I read it about four pages and it was some woman that was divorced and remarried and she's gone on four pages about this man's former wife and just on and on and on the bitterness and, and she's supposed to be a dear christian and i turned to my wife and said that's just going to get bigger and bigger it's going to destroy it's going to kill her there's nothing going to destroy you worse than bitterness. If you, you're sitting here now, you've got a root of bitterness and it is going to absolutely destroy you. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm thinking of a couple right now that I knew some 20 years ago and there was a root of bitterness. I was in their home and I, I, I had to get out. There was a root of bitterness. Folks, you know, they're in their 80s now and they're acquaintances of our family and the woman now has Alzheimer's and he's dying. He's got cancer. But for the past 20 years, all they talked about all day, every time you walk in, you heard the same thing rehearsed over and over again, how they were hurt, who wounded them and, and what people did to them and, and about their body ailments and their whole world's wrapped up in that little ball of bitterness. It's awful to be in their presence. Their own son called. He doesn't want to be near them. Nobody wants to go near them. The pastor of that church called me once. He said, I don't even want to go in their house. It's awful to be around people like that. But worse than being awful being around them, the Bible says you're not saved. You're not saved. Your sins are still piled up against you because you have not forgiven. You have not forgiven. Is there somebody you can't go up to and look them right in the eye? Is there something that makes you turn aside and you, you can't go near that Christian? Is there somebody, you're sitting on one side of the church because there's somebody on the other side you're trying to avoid. And as soon as somebody says, amen, you're out the door because you might bump into him or her. And you expect to spend eternity with them? <sighs> Do you remember when uh, a revival broke out in Samaria under Philip's preaching? They sent, the brethren sent Peter and John down. And there was a man by the name of Simon there. And the Bible says that Simon believed and uh, was baptized in water and he joined himself to the body. Peter and John come, they begin to lay hands on people. One after another, they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They're baptized in the Holy Ghost. And Simon comes to Peter and he offers him money. He says, give me money. I, I, how much do you want that I can have this power that I can lay hands on the sick or, or, or they lay hands on people and they receive this power. He tried to buy. And Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Thy Thou hast no part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right with God. And the spirit of discernment came on Peter, and Peter discerned in the spirit what his problem is. He said, for I perceive, or I discern, that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He said, now here, bitterness and iniquity are tied together as a bond, the scripture says. So that if you have bitterness in your heart, you are a work of iniquity. That's what the scripture says. And Peter uh, said, thy money perish with you. you now, what are you saying? You're bound for hell. You're lost. But I want to tell you something about this man, Simon. He had more sense than a lot of Christians. Folks, I have, I know there's some times that I've preached my heart out in this pulpit over the years. And I've known that there were some that needed to hear the message and they didn't hear it at all. They knew that I was under prophetic anointing of the Holy Ghost. They knew that the word was coming straight, unadulterated. They knew it was like a, it was like fire from heaven, like the hammer. It was the Holy Ghost. David Wilkerson was out of the picture. The Spirit of God was on me. And I know there are times that there are some that were so angry, if they didn't receive it, they walked right out, or they saw me sometime, and they had that hard, cold face. It didn't touch them. They just, that's not for me. And it was for them. They didn't receive it. They walked out, and many of them are not here anymore. But let me tell you, this man is different. This man says, Peter, pray ye to the Lord for me, 
that none of these things which you've spoken come upon me. Simon had respect for spiritual authority. He had respect for this man of God. He said, you are a man of truth. He said, I know your words are true. Pray that this doesn't happen to me. Pray that it doesn't happen to me. I know there's some people that God has made me a prophet to. And I know many don't listen, but one day they will. Everything that's said will come to pass. And you're hearing the word of God tonight. You know what I, the Holy Spirit's after? He's after you to lay this down. Whatever's in your heart, make things right. Get it out so that there's nothing standing between you. What do you do now with this? After you've heard this, the distinguishing marks of a work of iniquity. Now, what do you do when, if you stand before Jesus tonight? If your life is suddenly taken and you stand before Jesus, what are you going to do having heard the message? You were clearly described all the marks of a work of iniquity, and yet you did nothing about it. I beg of you in the name of Jesus, don't carry out of this church tonight any ill will, any bitterness. I don't care who it's against, how long it's been there, it's got to go. You bring it to Jesus tonight. He will heal you. He'll bless you. He'll restore to you all the years the canker worm has eaten. And you'll stand before him on that day. And he'll reach out, embrace you, pull him, pull you to his breast and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Are you a worker? Of iniquity. Holy Ghost, turn the searchlight on. Lord, if there's anything in our hearts, we've got to get it out. We have to humble ourselves and acknowledge it before you. Oh God, Holy Spirit, reach out in love. Reach out. Find it, Lord. Search it out. All of us. Let's examine our hearts before the Lord right now. So, oh God, search me. Try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. It doesn't mean you have to, to live under self-examination all the time. But when the word comes to search us out, it's time to obey him. Will you pray this prayer with me now from the depths of your heart? And I mean lift it out to the Lord. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me for all bitterness, for everything spoken out of my tongue and mouth that was displeasing to you. Sanctify my mouth. Cleanse my tongue. Give me a pure heart. Forgive me and cleanse me. I repent, Lord, of grieving you, of sinning against you. I need conviction, Lord. I need a new heart. Cleanse me wholly, completely. Thank you, Jesus, that you can take my bitterness, take it out, destroy it, and replace it with love. Lord, I do forgive those who have sinned against me that I may be forgiven of my heavenly father now I'm going to pray for you and I want you to believe God with me right now Holy Spirit I'm not the searcher of hearts but you certainly are you're able to probe deep your eye penetrates to the very core of our heart our mind and soul Lord Jesus show those that are in this church tonight anything that must be made right God let it be made right Lord the least that has to be done tonight is to get it out of the spirit, to get it out of the heart, that none of these things affect our spirit, that our spirits are kept pure and clean before you. Oh God, deal with all the lust and the problems of our flesh. We come to you, Lord, knowing that the blood does cleanse, that there's forgiveness, there's healing, there's restoration. Hallelujah. We can be restored in you, Lord. Days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.